Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag Nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Hello, welcome once again to Pros and Cons, a podcast by emerging writers for emerging writers. And right now it's just me, just me, Phoenix, here alone in this little podcast room. Uh, because we have something a bit different for you today. We have another interview, uh, this time with C.M. Kosenan. Uh I'm very excited. We got to have him on the show. He's the author of All Tomorrows, All Yesterdays, subsequently All Todays, um, as well as an overall just incredible artist, surrealist painter, illustrator. He's all over the board. Uh, one thing I love about his work is he he pulls quite a lot of influence from his knowledge of evolutionary biology, a topic of which he's very well read, and because of that his work is made all the richer for it. His worlds feel real and gripping, plausible. His credibility as an author is just... you buy in right away, and for that I, re- I highly recommend his work. But enough said here. Uh, I'll cut over to the interview, and you can hear more uh, from from him himself. Hope you enjoy. Yeah. So where where are you recording from? Uh, oh, I'm recording from Istanbul, Turkey. Yes, it's mm. a thirty degree day. That's for your American listeners. It's like eighty six degrees or something. Yeah, that's fine. And right. yes, uh, the blood temperature is the same as the warmth of warm tea. It's a very lazy morning for me. That's amazing. Yeah, it's. I can feel it already on the air. It's only 7.30 here in Barcelona, and it's already feeling pretty warm. Ooh, early, early day. Yeah. So uh, you live there, like, for, like, a sabbatical, or, like, or are you, like, always in there? How does it go? Do you do no, any other uh, work? My So I work as a freelance editor and mm-hmm. writer, so I'm moving... Um, I'm not bound. I'm not bound to any location. But um, mm-hmm. my wife and I have been moving around quite a bit recently. So she's from Chile. I'm from the mm-hmm. states. Oh, Australia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And now we're living here. Nice. Nice. Well, if you ever visit my part of the world, let me know, and I'd be happy to like show you around the town and introduce you to. The many beautiful and weird parts of this nice, interesting, crowded city. But don't do it during the hot season. Yeah. No, that'd be... I've been to... That'd be awesome. I've been to Istanbul once. um, Oh, okay. For five days. Only, like, back when I was 21, I think. 20 or 21, right around there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's an overwhelming city. It's, like, in an amazing way. But, like, I just remember... I've never seen a street that crowded before. That main, like, sort of artery that you guys. Oh have. yes, yes. What is it I called? I call again? it. It's called the Istiklal Street, but I call it the street of heads. Literally, like it's a <laughs> carpet of smarmy human heads and backs of necks and stuff. It's really teeming. Yeah. Well, that that place kind of suffered, to be honest. It's been like, I mean, if you can picture the light of Times Square. I think you get a mm. rough estimate. So, I mean, it attracted all the wrong crowd from international visitors and locals. Um, and yeah. it's just like, there are still like on the side streets, there are like oases and like nice places where you could hang out and like see interesting places. Mm. But mostly it's become like uh, shisha bars and like these very weird ruffian tourists only man you know the kind of ah. yeah yeah it's become like foot massage tattooist uh, shady nightclub shady ah, okay. tattoo parlor stuff like that yeah no, i remember oh. it very much never have i felt more like i was in a river of people like an yeah. actual river it was really something well we'll go ahead and launch right in then so yeah, yeah. for all those listening at home, I'm joined here today with C.M. Kozeman, 
and um and you go you go by cm or memo or memo i go with memo that the memo is the m in cm kozman and my real name is Jevdet mehmet koseman but i at one point years back i realized if i want to speak to a more international community of readers and friends then i'd better have a more memorable uh, moniker and i mm -hmm. looked at my favorite sci-fi writers arthur clark was ac clark there's uh, yeah. uh, steve sterling so he is sm sterling so i said yeah i think this like two initials and interesting last name combination goes <laughs> well there's so a pattern kinda, there yeah i kind of stuck with that and lo and behold slowly but surely i am becoming slightly known in certain circles and i can't complain no no i um so for those the, those of you that don't know memo here is the author of all tomorrows which mm -hmm. is um you can listen on youtube mm -hmm. it's a very gripping story we're going to get into that more um mm -hmm. as well as the co-author co-creator of all yesterdays mm -hmm. and just a smattering of other artistic endeavors um yeah i had a look i had a look at your cv and honestly i was like whoa i can't really pin this guy very much he's all over the board but there there are through lines but i love that yeah i'm i've been i've been lucky as a as an artist a painter a, mm. an author and also on the sidelines uh, as an illustrator mm. i also have a day job i'm a copywriter for advertising and pr companies so still hustling for an honest <laughs> li honest lira so there's that yeah. too but i think like if someone on somebody's aunt asks i said i'm an artist and an author and i nice. think that covers it and if i get the question what kind of art you do i'm like i'm a surrealist painter mm -hmm. that was actually um the second question i had for you oh no mm -hmm. sorry it's the third question mm -hmm. is if someone asks you at a party what do you do um i was gonna ask you to describe that because i thought that, that would help. so well, surrealist author yeah yeah and a writer yeah if if i had to boil it down to like only one word i would still pick artist i think mm. and but yeah that that short answer took years to years to perfect i mean i was very awkward like i kind of draw dinosaurs but like <laughs> they evolve differently and then I, I look and the person is already in the other end of the room but <laughs> if they only knew so i love that as a description so much i kind of draw dinosaurs like if they were different and it's like that's what i do yeah uh but i think that's many of us in this day and age find us, ourselves in this role huh? i mean i'm sure like you got multiple hats and most people most creative people i know have multiple hats oh yeah and it's just a sign of the times i guess yeah it's amazing how um because I started as an engineer, actually. That's what I went mm. to school for. And it was always nice to give that answer to people because it's so like everyone has a story around engineer. It's like impressive, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and I've noticed um, it's a lot easier now to again give that answer now that I have like freelance editor under there and stuff. It's very mm -hmm. easy to say editor and writer. It's like very digestible. Yeah, and it's, yeah. I felt good when I landed on that answer. Yes, yes. I think like figuring that out is like one third of the way. And mm -hmm. after that, you're good to go. And sometimes once you find that answer, you start becoming that, even once you just start saying that. Yeah, yeah. And in due time, it also gets to stick on you, but that's a whole other uh, can of worms. Mm. So I, I, I'd rather answer your questions than <laughs> rambling on to tangents of my own. Okay, so uh, how we usually start these episodes is um, we have a bit of a panel on these usually. Um mm -hmm. So we usually go around and just see kind of where everyone's at right now. What are they? So like, what are you watching? What are you mm -hmm. reading? What are your current present artistic like uh, pools mm -hmm. that you're dipping into? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So um, let me start by what I'm reading, actually. I'm this past month, I've been reading the collected works of Lewis Mumford. The, that's M U M. Mm -hmm. F O R D, and uh, basically he's an American. Well, he's a bit like what we just described. 
technically he's an architectural and art critic but oh, yeah. in practice he's a real visionary thinker and i think a very inspiring for me very inspiring philosopher mm. so he starts off from architecture and basically writes uh, a form of the ted kaczynski philosophy that doesn't mm. involve trips to the post office and uh, that's less paranoid i think his his philosophy basically Ma lewis mumford is all about warning against the effects of overt mechanization in society mm. starting slightly from architecture but like he's a cranky old guy and he just like the way he writes so succinct i mean and long story short every few pages in this book he drops a bomb like basically he's he's talking for example about the city plan of san francisco mm. and how that like mesh of grids was like irresponsibly imposed into that terrain of undulating hills and stuff mm. and he basically says when people proposed like curving paths that hugged the contours of the hills mm. the response was oh that's how cows walk but he said if you were only as smart as cows and uh, <laughs> right. so there that sort of guy but so that's what I'm reading on one end. What I'm um, watching, I don't know, a whole other stuff. Um, there's this TV series. It was six years old and we are recording in 2023. So it's, it's like Halt and Catch Fire. It's the, oh. it's this kind of like... I don't know why that kinda, sounds familiar. Kind of smarmy, but also like uh, watchable selections from the lives of these tech developers in the 1980s and Ooh. it's basically like i mean you know you when you're talking about food you don't eat like sophisticated french cuisine all the time you sometimes have to have cheese it's and marshmallows and that's that's that for my uh, weaving regimen so it's yeah it started out as a really nice series but I'm in the second season now. And there are these characters that are just, I mean, coolness is oozing out of every pore of these guys. And I don't know, you just episode after episode, watch what they're up to. And it's tolerable. It's nice. So that's what I'm watching these days. I'm also watching some like old Hammer House of Horror films on YouTube. Those are still free. Ah, okay. With Sir Christoph Lee and Peter Cushing in them. There was this one about giant leeches taking over a quiet British town and those things I really watch and I, oh, I really I enjoy the them. Stone. Yeah, I forgot the name but I think it's like the creeping brain terror or the crawling brain terror or something like that. Oh my gosh. It sounds like um I'm unfamiliar with this. It sounds like I picture like 1950s horror, like really old sort of yeah. black and white sort of thing. Yeah, 50s going into color actually. It's like a very sweet sw sweet spot of British cinema history, uh -huh. late 50s until the early or mid 70s, in fact. Wow. Also, a lot of stuff in the 60s. Most of them are in color. Just, I mean, if you still go on YouTube and all our uh, listeners are welcome to try this, mm -hmm. uh, look for Peter Cushing. That's the guy who plays uh, Grand Moff Tarkin in the original Star Wars. So, oh, whoa. Yeah, so before he landed that role, he actually had this long and illustrious career of these films, and he just has such a nice character, even though the films are kind of, like, silly. Mm. You know, I, I like the naivete, and basically, to to use an overused word, how based those films are, I really like those ones. So that's that for me. I'm not watching some extra sophisticated weird stuff i mean if anyone was curious sorry to disappoint in that respect. oh no what i'm <laughs> what i'm watching right now is um breaking bad for the first time oh. i'm finally getting on that bandwagon yeah i i just watched like half of the first season mm -hmm. and i mean we just also at the time that's almost a decade ago now at the time we also had some cancer issues in the family mm. so i just like you know i said i'm i'm already thinking about this shit in daily life 
I'm not gonna like it. <laughs> my so I never got on the bandwagon, but I hear it's pretty nice. So 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 enjoy watching. Thank you. Yeah, it's I kind of watched a season and then I stopped for not because I didn't like it, I just kind of stopped and then mm -hmm. years and years later, here we are finally picking it back up. And then I just started recently listening to an audiobook of Jade City by Fonda Lee. That's it. Ooh. Okay, not not familiar with it, but is it fiction? Is it non-fiction? How is it's, it? It's fiction. It's like an urban fantasy. Uh, Ooh. So kind of like, um, it kind of feels like fictional sort of Japanese gang sort of stuff. Oh, but it's, a bit has... like a bit like those weird fiction, like Murakami kind of stuff. Or probably so I'm I... unfamiliar with that, but <laughs> probably. Yeah. It's got some cool, um, so like martial based combat stuff, as well as some mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. subtle uh, material, mineral based, in this case, jade mm -hmm, based mm -hmm. sort of power magic sort of stuff. Very, very well written. Very, I'm deep in the setup and I'm very much enjoying it. Sounds like a great summer reading. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I, I can't wait to, in a couple of days, I'm due down at the seaside. And I can't Ooh. wait to, yeah, I can't wait to curl up at the beach with this old guy rambling about how bad architecture represents society's mechanical decay. <laughs> just, the, just the thing for the season. <laughs> yeah, but that's, um. so bringing that guy up, because you mentioned he's an architect first, and mm -hmm. then it seems like that informs quite a bit of his writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it has like a backbone of architecture rooted in what he does i is that correct to say Would... i don't think mumford was an architect directly i don't think he mm. even like studied anything distinct i mean like he just was a good writer and mm. like for for some time in his in this book actually he talks a a bit about like basically what he was and what he wants to become and he actually he identifies that as a, a distinct problem in, in American culture then. I think it's become a problem of world culture now. Basically, the re reduction of the individual to their vocation. Yeah. But he's like really cranky. And I think deep down inside, I'm a bit cranky too. And he said, no, I'm going to fight. And I'm going to become this like weird amalgam and weird alloy. Not quite what anyone wants me to be, but what I want to be, but I don't know. And you're going to be sitting so on the beach just... going, yes, yes, <laughs> I feel yes, you. Yes, every, between between 15 minute cat naps, it's going to be like, preach on brother. <laughs> and then maybe sleep, uh, slip into the water and then, that's right. And then again. <laughs> <laughs> but I love, um, it just reminded me, like, I really, I tend to like writing or I have a very sweet spot for authors that seem to have a very, um, it seems like they're almost, they have a focal point in their regular life. Like, you know, you have Tolkien, who's, you know, got this rich English background, as well as like mm -hmm. a lot of li skills as a linguist. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's almost like they're that first and then decide they want to write as well. And their fiction becomes some of the most fascinating fiction because it's like they have this one really strong route to reality that they just lean mm -hmm. in through and it can be, it doesn't need to be some like, you know, you're very informed and it, it really doesn't matter what it is. Like you could be a geologist and because of yep. this amazing tether through your geological knowledge, you have this amazing route to reality that just makes your work so rich. And that was one yes. thing that I loved about your work is because you have this, this amazing route through like evolutionary speculation mm -hmm, that just mm -hmm. makes it, it feels so like, I'm just with you right along for the ride. Oh. And I wanted oh. to I wanted to ask you like because looking through your CV it wasn't like well at least from the CV like I just saw like you know you have some biology classes in there um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I guess where did this deep sort of evolutionary biology lens sort of develop? Well, I think part of it was like always in me. I always liked seeing strange creatures. Mm. But then I mean the thanks here must go to my family that, um, I mean, I was born in Turkey and they were very careful that I got a quote-unquote international education, which entailed sending me to 
basically imagine they teleport to the regular K-12 high school from the United States to the suburbs of Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And this high school, aside from all those great teachers, also had a complete K-12 American library. And oh. I can't tell you how much, like, then I went to study at Cornell University, but I would dare say that that library had a greater impact on me than the Ivy League school because I was still set straight when I was there. But it had books like Incredible Life by uh, Conway Morris and The Fossils of the Burgress Shale. That's for uh, that's the fossils of the Cambrian explosion mm -hmm. when all those weird creatures first evolved. And they were all in their original English language. So... I was a bit of a recluse during elementary school and high school years. So mm. I was just holed up in this K-12 library reading these books. When I was not doing that, I was actually out in the... The school had a big backyard that basically extended into this kind of nondescript suburban prairie. And I was just out there catching reptiles and lizards. Then I was just either indoor, uh, just reading about this stuff. And so I got an early start and I always like, I was interested in strange creatures, but if it hadn't been for that education, maybe I would have remained the like purely fantasist or like have remained confined to the realm of like dragons and shit. And, <laughs> but then I, I began to learn about these patterns in life. And then when time came to go to college, I was accepted uh, from Cornell University, I, I took, I was planning to do a dual major there, zoology and filmmaking. Oh, yeah. And so I got like the technical foundations alongside the philosophical, uh, basically discussions around this. I mean, but then I realized also reading is quite fun too. And I look, I think I was blessed with a good memory. So I could like take things from a certain thing and like, adapted to another thing but as i read and read i realized that this sort of weird gap developed along my reading habits let me say that much yeah so either i either focused on like extremely technical real stuff like fossils from a certain formation or like i'm just looking beetles of the world carnivores of the world magic in the malay peninsula stuff like this so like oh yeah first source real stuff Love or it. or straight up uh, non fiction that is to say like memoirs of a turkish uh, customs inspector something like that love that those things are fine too or i gravitated towards like i said this is my humble and personal perspective I said, if I was going to read fiction, just read like science fiction and like go mm. all the way. Because I always realized like when I read, like there's, there's great fiction out there too, but when I read like, let's just say okay fiction writing, mm -hmm. I realized how uh, dry and cardboard it felt compared to like real life memoirs I re I'd also been reading on the sides. Yeah. So this kind of like foundation developed with like, let us say, two and a half very widely spread legs one on like wild science fiction mm. one in like basically reference books let me just say that much and one in on memoirs and based on that i began to like i said okay i can do something like that and i just began doing what i did and here we are uh it's a very your your um K twelve experience sounds very romantic in retrospect. Um, yes, yes. I mean, Turkish schools say what you will about them, but I think there's less bullying than in American schools. I don't know though. Mm. I don't know, but I think I'm convinced that college is a kind of like college is a time when like the stones fall into place. But I think mm. the few years before that is when the stones are crafted in my humble mm. opinion and then it's like making sure the students feel free enough to craft mm -hmm. whatever stones they feel called to and aren't feeling you know because social pressures are so big at that age yeah. you're so susceptible to peer pressures 
so many oh, people yeah. can miss out on things they love just because they're scared of loving them or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and I also think that um, family and uh, social conditions play a role there too. I mean, absolutely. I, I was very lucky. And I mean, there are families like, I, I was a weird kid and there are families like if their son or daughter is a little bit weird, uh, they're like, uh, they like do their damnedest best to kind of like iron that personality back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just an unfortunate part of life. And I'm not be even beginning to cover the lack of circumstance. I mean, I look at so people. I look at people I meet in life, and I see like many people who could have been like me, or even better than me. People could, who could have been like my favorite authors or artists, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just because of lack of social opportunities or economic opportunities, you know, I think it's kind of hard to like not fall into that clickiness and like the whole like pack dwelling monkey human game you know if mm -hmm. things are bad at home if you're starving at home like you get you fall into that because you got no choice mm -hmm. so i always knock on wood i don't know <laughs> i'll knock on wood too and then you did um actually didn't check the dates on these but all tomorrows did come before all yesterdays ironically yes all tomorrows came before almost everything and ah okay uh, until it became this, like, I first started writing and illustrating it in high school. Then oh my when gosh. I went to, yeah, yeah, when I went to university, I kind of, like, I had a lot of spare time. And I just basically, like, finished writing it and just released it. I never thought it would have been, like, this well-known or this well-received because mm. teenage angst kind of phase of my life. And... Well, maybe, I don't know, I must have done something right. So now, thanks to this newfound celebrity that that book has, mm. uh, I'm actually rewriting and re-illustrating it. So, oh, whoa. So there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, That's I, very I need to... exciting. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, there are many things about the old book that I just flat out didn't like. Mm. And like, didn't like... But it's got its charms too. I don't know. So I don't know. From this point on, you ask and I answer. Cause... <laughs> the that's um. So I didn't realize it was illustrated by you until after I'd listened to it. Um, because mm -hmm. there are so many illustrations, I just assumed, oh, this is for sure someone, like mm -hmm. whoever's reading this or pu like putting somebody's adding images to this after the fact. So I actually, when I was Ooh. listening to it didn't want to look at the images because I just assumed it was some compilation someone did on YouTube. And I was like, oh, I don't want to <laughs> see. I don't want to see because I want to imagine. I want to imagine the things as I hear it. Um, and then afterwards, I was like, oh, illustrated by CM Cosman and Tom, like also. And then um, I was like, oh, now I have to listen again and look at the creatures because yeah. they are how he imagined them. Yeah, I mean, the whole project actually started life as an art project because... Basically, I was drawing these like weird post-human creatures without any context of a story behind them. And then I realized, well, you know, let me write something around those things. So I came up with the story of these like galactic invaders because with some of those forms, there's no way like if people keep on building, if people persist with their mechanical civilization... There's mm -hmm. no way you're going to like turn into an underground creature. Like you'd yeah. sooner go extinct. You won't find the external influence to get us there really. Yeah, so I came up with this plot device of this like uh, galactic invader species. It was just like literally a plot device. But then many people liked them, took a life of its own, so I don't know, must have been something right there. And I just like put everything together. And it was the years of deviant art in 2005 or 2006. And I just threw everything into a Google Drive and I just said, hey, there's this book, download it if you want. And at first there was like a bunch of maybe, I don't know, 20 to 40 people who really liked this and popularized mm -hmm. it. And it remained that way for like practically until 2017, 18. Mm -hmm. I think Many of the readers for this book come from America, and I think it accelerated like the 
American discovery of this book accelerated uh, with two things. Mm. One, uh, as a generation more versed in like evolutionary natural history stuff, yeah, grew up and matured. And number two, I think basically what happened in the States after 2016, and it kind of accelerated in the last three, four years, it kind of like created this kind of like, oh, the world is ending atmosphere among uh, American readers, most of it. So I think that whole theme of catastrophe resonated in a way. Yeah, I feel that. It feels very zeitgeisty at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it was the the COVID pandemic that really gave it like the kick in the engine. And then, ooh, and I think the generation who was born after the year 2000, they really picked this up because like when I was writing this book, it sounds like, like, for example, right now we talk about multiverses or like yeah. the reality being a simulation and stuff like that. I mean, times were... In, until the mid 2000s, mid double O's, many people could not understand these themes. You have to realize, like, it took a film like The Matrix for the concept of a simulated reality to become a kind of commonplace, referable idea in 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 society at large. Back before that, you could say, "Oh, so it's a dream." Like, like many people <laughs> didn't get this. Same with the whole parallel universe or multiverse effect. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I remember like really like debate fighting with people in order for them to understand because the the idea of time being a circle, like uh, if mm -hmm. you change something, then your mom would die and you wouldn't exist. But you really couldn't get across the point that no, actually time could split. How do you split time? Like a branch. No, it has to be a loop. And you have to realize many people, like, I'm not blaming, I'm not calling anyone stupid or nothing, but, like, these ideas, like, really took a lot of hammering from popular culture to, mm -hmm. like, seep into people's minds. Mm -hmm. Now now it's everyone's like, oh, you're the best simulated reality that happened to me and stuff. Like, it's become, like, well understood. Same with all tomorrows, that the notion people could evolve the notion even that the people had evolved or you could take such niches, you know, mm. it wasn't really something that many people could accept for better or worse uh, until like maybe 10 years ago, actually. I mean, imagine like, uh, I just imagine it because you take it to quite a few extremes, some some like um, very visceral and vaguely uncomfortable places, which I you know it has that we're all human listening mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. it so we have this innate anchor to it it's like whoa mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you did what to the human form but i was just mm -hmm. thinking like if you wrote this like a few hundred years ago you you may have been killed for this work oh maybe <laughs> or, maybe or, yeah maybe not in my part of the world but in in europe uh, yeah. Or, yeah i don't know europe. yeah I, I get what you mean i mean back when back in those days the whole i think debate about the whole debate about this early new atheism days, you know, this sort of misplaced conviction that the internet would render religion obsolete. Mm. And as just, just we only need to breed these creationists and make everyone understand evolution and boom, everybody's problems would be solved. There was a sort of naive phase in the early days of the internet. I think some of that has seeped in. Uh, now that you prompted this train of thought. But for me always, I mean, I, I knew people had evolved, mm -hmm. but for me, I don't know. I never had that kind of like mm, messianic zeal about making everyone understand evolution. But certainly some points, like some points in all tomorrows, such as that, like, I mean, when people think evolution, still to this day, they think like, or if it's more evolved, it must be smarter. There's this yeah. horrible film with Scarlett Johnson in it, like she becomes evolved and advanced so she can use more of her brain and has sonar and like can uh, think yeah. faster than computer. So that's like a kind of like 
false view of evolution, but evolution is just the best luck of the best adapted. So in this book, I try to show circumstances where like humans could quote unquote be reduced to the level of animals, but at least life would go on. So there was a bit of that intent behind my works too. The the notion of like, oh, evolution is forward and evolution means more brain capacity and even the idea of forward, it's like, well, what's forward? But like mm-hmm. um like a uh, higher brain capacity, higher whatever mm-hmm. abilities mm-hmm. like that. That's based on our current idea of what we like about our current form. And it's like these mm-hmm. are advantages that we've found in ourselves. So it's natural for us to want those to be the points that evolve further but we don't necessarily yeah. get a say in that and it's um so it can go any no, direction no. yeah yeah i think like also because these are all like quote unquote cerebral subjects there's always the kind of tendency to equate like further evolution with like bigger brain like big mm-hmm. brain guys like uh, <laughs> almost like so but that actually is not the case and like in this idea actually you sometimes see the People who claim to be smarter are actually like flat out turn out to be weird racists or sexists at the end. So, uh, yeah. so it's a hairy, hairy business. And I just wanted to like, also it comes from like uh, reading about the Cambrian explosion in, in high school. So just like a quick intro. Yeah, please. When multi-celled animals first evolved, you got to understand like for like, Life kind of evolved, and then for like nearly a billion years, it was just like bacteria or some very simple worms. And then in like the last 600 million years, suddenly there was an explosion of forms, kind of like worms, mollusks, and ancestors of the earliest fish and like arthropods and stuff like that. But when this explosion first occurred, there were lots of very strange forms quite didn't get anywhere. Uh, very famous example is Opabinia with five eyes and a weird like uh, vacuum cleaner mouth. So these, these were thought to be like creatures with left no descendants and were like these sort of like, monstrous early examples. We kind of now know that they actually also had a pattern in themselves, but they had body plans that were never quite repeated afterwards. So, like, imagine, like, a kind of like a swimming fish-like thing with multiple fins, but the front part is an insect, but it has five eyes, wow. and it, the mouth is like a kind of gas mask with a kind of claw on top of it, but that's not the oh real mouth. It's just the thing that grasps the food and tucks it into the real mouth, which is just below the five eyes. So, like, lots of weird creatures like that. The Implication was that if the dice was rolled again, maybe evolution could have went along a different path and we could have been living in the sort of five-eyed, snappy mouth universe. And then things like vertebrates could have been an afterthought. So, like, when you study those things, there's a bit more to that, but, like, uh, suffice it to say, for a surface-level discussion, when you study those things... You, it becomes apparent that it could have gone either way and we are speaking from the bottom of the cone of events let me let us just say yeah but that's actually really refreshing because it just means that there's no like there's no great success or great failure in the greater scheme of things but i mean from this i got a sort of Kesera, sera, whatever will be, will be. <laughs> Tomorrow is not ours to see. And yeah. I found that kind of comforting. I it know. I, I, I hope I could keep the train of thought congruent here. But so that's the sense I got from studying evolution. And that's the kind of sense I wanted to put into all tomorrows as like teen, angsty, and like in some parts cringely written as it sounds. <laughs> I still like that. I didn't find any part of it cringy, to be honest. I I didn't. Ah, uh, so thank you. Yeah, the I love that like um, being on the bottom of the evolutionary cone because it's so we have the the tendency to whatever's around us becomes our normal. So it's like oh we're human we're you know 
apex predators sort of thing and we're it's very easy to see or just kind of take the notion that it's like oh we were inevitable like this is we were where evolution was pointing it's like no we're mm-hmm. where evolution ended up and it's like such a yeah yeah i i agree. that very well i agree and i think like another little thing that helped was like in the last 20 years a lot of really smart really talented talented people grew up uh trained by like helped along by the internet and the possibilities it entails and i think just reading like there's this whole sort of marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message kind of thing that when you read stuff online you get better used to the possibility of multiple possibilities Mm. whereas in the old pre-internet world it was just just books and like a one-way line of information communication true and i think it kind of like um necessitated a certain linear understanding of the world which wasn't bad but it was what it was yeah i think in the ensuing generations uh, humanity's entire way of dealing with information traded persistence for an appreciator appreciation of broader possibilities mm. so there i like that outlook on it like uh mm-hmm. i've had a sort of nihilism around how information travels around today because it just to me has felt like there's been so much noise um yeah yeah and a lot a part of digesting information these days is being able to filter through the noise and kind of find what you want to actually digest um so i like how you put it it's like uh we're trading a more linear path for i don't know more broader possibilities it's a bit more temporal and we're a bit uh i guess yeah it's almost like maybe that's a good thing like the mind we're not just reading something and taking it as fact immediately it's like it, it kind of swims in the mind a little bit and it's like well let's see and we do some i guess larger pattern connecting from that place if we're gonna then yeah. pull more sources before we make conclusions that's a yeah, good practice yeah. <clears throat> yeah and i think like aside from some very broad conclusions the whole like whole issue becomes not a- arriving at conclusions except mm. for some certain very broad and simple issues but it basically becomes the whole aesthetics of uh, running and managing a train of thought and like how how good you cultivate your garden of ideas mm. so oh, that's beautiful yeah yeah so less of maybe that debate bro thing where and more of like being able to say ah but then there was this guy who once said this huh and that's interesting or like ah i don't know but it's, it's we should look into this like i think these two things like that's interesting and i don't know i think those are like the coolest ballsiest things anyone interested in any line of thought can say true the i do so i have a few more questions about um all tomorrows and then i want to branch into some other stuff but when i was hearing it i'm not sure if this was intentional or not but as as humanity started to get spread into Mm. kind of the more even just more distant life forms and spread so in like um unrecognizably Mm -hmm. i started to see like oh it's kind of becoming kind of circular at this point because um you know like we share ancestry with a lot of like with trees even like way distant 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 ancestors and stuff like that and our Mm -hmm. dna is similar so i started thinking like well i mean who's to say you know we we have this distant strand of dna connecting us like we can call that human dna and these are other forms of human i guess if you want it's i mean Mm -hmm. misleading based on speciation and stuff like that but I started to kind of see that pattern as species started to spread out further in all tomorrows where it's like, well, this is almost essentially what's going on with us. It just depends on how you define humans. Like could the humans in your book even mate with each other and create offspring? I don't know, probably not, but like it, it depends on sort of those definitions. And I wanted to kind of see if that was that an intentional thing to kind of create this sensation of circularity. A bit. I mean, Back then, one of the biggest critiques I had a problem with was this sort of false accusation that 
evolution made people selfish and it be made people darwinian and like oh if it's only science we we can be as cruel as we want and this was a, a, a misplaced critique coming from these creationist or religious conservative spears of the internet but then you realize actually if you understand your evolution you recognize a kinship of life uh, stretching, as you said, to trees and back and probably into the distant future as well. So there's no reason why you can't use that understanding to be more compassionate and like more thankful and arrive at uh, arrive at sort of more uplifting, heartfelt thoughts that people also arrive through the love of God, mm. which I have no problem with. But I just wanted to show that, you know, I mean, it's kind of going to sound hippie-ish, but we are all interlinked. Bring it on. And we are all a big family of uh, feuding, fighting, um, coexisting creatures. And, I mean, philosophically, I think the, the quote-unquote evil caveat there comes from the sort of early Enlightenment belief that only humans could know, therefore we can only have subjective experiences and animals are like organic machines, whereas mm -hmm. that's certainly not true. People have, look, people have homologous bones, you know, the bones in my hand extend into the wings of a bat or mm -hmm. the fins of a dolphin. So you saw so the same thing with feelings and sentiments and I clearly see no objection to why animals or even like simple organisms could not have the same self-awareness or feelings that we have. So I just wanted to get that across, to be honest. Mm. Uh, this other question. So my brother was the one that initially sent this story through to me. He was like, you got to listen to this. And I was like, okay. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I asked him if he had any questions and he wanted to know I don't know if you have an answer to this, but do you know, do you have an idea of what the music to the snake people sounded like? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I always thought, okay, I'm just going to quote the letters now. Mm -hmm. uh, they should look at this obscure Ottoman song called the Nikris Longa, which is N-I-K-R-I-Z-L-L. O N G A, the Nikris Longa, which goes like la 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 na 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 sort of more undulating sinuous melodies. Okay. Maybe 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 a bit like that, but of course, this in the book, the snake people don't have external ears, so it has to like come from ground vibration. So take that and adapt it into that. Yeah, and and maybe maybe you get a sense with the snake people also a formative memory, and I'm revealing this to your listeners for the first time. Uh -huh. A formative memory was basically in our house there was a laundry room, but this was like a long narrow room, okay, and the dryer was there, so I could like in cold winter days, I lined the entire room with bed sheets. And crawled in next to the dryer, which was like, woo, yeah, and like blasting this pleasant stream of hot air. And I don't know, it just makes this mechanical white noise, which was just, ooh, I mean, <laughs> that sounds wonderful, honestly. So I, I like hit there, you know. Also, there's the added sense that basically your parents are taking care of you and uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's like really cozy. So that's how I imagine the snake people would be like, you know, like very small but cozy like dwellings. Yeah. And sometimes maybe the entire structure has this kind of like vibrating machine melody from the basement up. Uh -huh. But you know, every every tenant is feeling that and vibing. So maybe that could be some of the sentiment behind it. But thanks to your brother for this awesome question. Yeah, that's... That's great. That sounds like a very soothing society. Just a hum that's kind of pumped through the city for everyone to kind of yeah. mellow out to. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, with little details like that, you really flesh out the characters, even though mm. the book is very short and it's just one one creature and like, but if you just drop one hint about them having music or like, I don't know, them liking to dance or something, mm -hmm. it really sticks with people, I think. so. It really does. Yeah, so I'm happy I got to do that, yeah. I was actually, now that you say that, was that, um, because it did actually feel the one, the the human form that kind of adopted the most human nature, I guess at least mm -hmm. the more romantic side of human nature, um, did feel to be the snake people when I was going through. It's like we sort of learned about they had hopes, they had dreams, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Was that kind of more because you had this sort of very intimate tie to this particular form? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I mean, maybe it takes the labors of a psychiatrist or something, but it could <laughs> be, I mean, I always like snakes and reptiles as, and I remember like for part, part of the time I was writing this book, I also kept a grass snake as a temporary pet. Ah, uh, yeah. So, oh, I don't know, maybe it filters. Yeah. I like those animals. I mean, like, there's uh, there's this one book about basically reptile photography and it's by a French author mm. and it basically says that a reptile pet will not reciprocate like a cat or a dog and it will not look at you it will not sing to you but know that it will happy to be there if you take good care of it so I think that kind of stuck with me too so oh. I don't know that's like really cute that's very cute. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, I'm just kind of happy to be here. We're all here. Happy to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, be not be next to me, but don't get in my face and we'll be fine. Yeah, I don't think... touch me, but I'm good. Yeah, yeah. I think, like, as an adolescent, too, I must have felt a bit of that because I was, like, a bit introverted. Still mm. am, but in a mm. strange, other, different way, I think. I share that. And uh, because you mentioned the Q being... Mm -hmm. like or the the external force that's causing the initial like massive mm -hmm. branching kind of like a, a cambrian explosion from a different angle yeah, uh, yeah the um you mentioned that being a plot device and it's like you don't need it to be anything more than a plot device because it is you just need something to kick off an explosion and then the it's a plot kick and then from yeah, there yeah. you can explore the heart of the book which is these species and you do start mm -hmm. to set up like a very um there's an abstract plot we weaving behind the back of it the sort of um it starts to come together at the end a little bit it's almost like um well it's really just perseverance of i guess human species or it's like uh they start forming a bit of an alliance at the end mm -hmm. i don't even know what i would call it but there's you you're rooting for these species and you're kind of yeah. wanting them to find some sort of ground at the end and they i won't say what happens but like um I don't know. I don't really have a question off this. I just kind of wanted to say, because you're talking about these intimate points that anchor people down through these species and stuff. And it's like, mm -hmm. and, you mentioned, and then you have a very broad stroke, which is the cue. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, they're tools in a toolbox of a writer for a reason. It's like, well, you don't need the cue to be anything else because you just need a plot kick. And something yeah, like that. back then that was the case. Now, unfortunately, because of this rewrite and my uh, pedantism, <laughs> They are going to be like something and there's going to be oh. something slightly of a reveal at the end about the Q, which I now call the Kuhanim, which kind of sounds cooler with it multiple does. syllables. Love and a few syllables. Yeah, yeah. So just stay tuned for that. But if your listeners follow me on Patreon.com, sometimes I drop little nuggets and hints here and there. Nice. By the way, actually... For your listeners only, I have a small excerpt I could read. For... Please. Okay. So in this new book, now it's much more like multifaceted and like multi-angled. So now there will be multiple post-human species that don't descend from people, but from the creatures they brought along to terraform their planets before the arrival of the Kuhanim. Mm. So there will be lots of worlds in which humans are extinct, but weird life forms brought over from Earth and that have sometimes 
somehow endured the reign of the coup have prospered. Mm. So now I'm going to give you two paragraphs from basically what happens in these worlds and these from and about these non-human post-humans. And awesome. I could say, let's start reading now. Now behold those descendants of humanity who were not humans themselves. In those worlds where humanity had dined out, they flowered into rich profusion, establishing thriving ecosystems populated by vast new arrays of species and clades. Mere fish and insects, cattle and fowl, arachnids and reptiles diversified into such outlandish forms and swapped roles in such profanity that an observer from the past would hardly recognize them as earthly life. There were worlds in which flies grew to the size of dragons or remained as larvae and thrashed across the waves as, as leviathans, where fish grew wings and flew, where birds established semi-sessile EU social colonies and battled with proboscis bearing hordes of flying reptiles. A thousand worlds where regressed birds or advanced reptiles once again established infinite reigns of new fangled archosaurs. Worlds where spiders grew into crystalline, wind-threading angels. Worlds where the last mammals shrank to the size of pits and sought refuge from successive waves of land-invading Selechians. Worlds where thundering land mollusks ran along welt lands of photosynthetic fungi, projectile vomiting loud darts into one another. <laughs> Relentless orgasms of speciation and diversity. So there's there's just Ooh. yeah for your <laughs> listeners only. So I love um with how like uh you pull it in so many like directions it becomes humorous in a way and i love that sense of humor like where it's just like we're just gonna pervert this thing to the end mm -hmm. but be through that perversion it becomes beautiful again and it's just like it's it has such a sense of humor to me all right all right yes yes i mean that's um that's something i'm trying to do and i think it also sounds like weirder in my accented delivery so <laughs> <laughs> no thank you very much that was that was very that's awesome i love the i'm a big spider fan so to hear uh what well, happens it, with the arachnids a bit, they're incredible yeah. yeah they're like i think little cats especially if you look at jumping spiders oh my gosh yes i mean if you finish the game as a jumping spider you get reincarnated as a cat <laughs> they um one time i had a jumping spider on my hand and it was mm -hmm. just like jumping from finger to finger and then i'd mm -hmm. put my next hand on and it would continue jumping along the fingers and it was the first time i'd held a jumping spider mm -hmm. and it felt like a little pet yeah they also yeah. they're so advanced visually like we have that um you know i feel like we connect very well with other animals that are visual as well because we're so visual so we have this like through line yes. between us and to have that an arachnid that when you approach it, it looks up at you because it's picking up on you visually. Like to have that connection, it's like, whoa, we see yeah. each other. They do the whole like body shift and stare thing, which is really mm -hmm. cute. And <laughs> it's <endearing>. so cute. <laughs> the old body shift and stare. So off of this, we will we will branch a bit because you have some other projects. Um, so you have the, the All Yesterday's Project, which I read a bit of that book as well. And it feels... And I'm not sure if this is the nature of just what it is, but it feels more um, maybe it's just because my my instinct is to say it's more academical. It's more like uh, rooted in reality, I want to say. But then when I really think back on it, I would say it's more it's mm -hmm. equally as speculative as all tomorrows. It's just we have fossil records to work off of, but it's still um, delving into unknown and asking questions like what if? What if it was like mm -hmm. this? What if it was like this? It could just as easily be like this because there's so much room for speculation, even looking back. Um, mm -hmm. I guess what would you, what would you say? I don't even know what the question is off of that. I just kind of I just said, well, I mean, let, let me broach into all yeah. yesterday's as well. It was actually like my first quote unquote serious book, mm. which was like published and like people could buy from Amazon and like I could get money for in return. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this with my uh, close friend, John Conway. 
Mm. And later on, we also brought uh, Darren Nash aboard for writing the introduction. And he also like picked up the flag, uh, bless his soul. He then moved on to like bigger projects like the Apple TV dinosaur prehistoric planet thing. Mm. So the three of us collaborated for this thing. I wrote most of the text actually. Mm. And together with John Conway, I produced half of the illustrations. It was a kind of like basically the, I mean, the unrestrained fire I had in All Tomorrows. Mm -hmm. It's still in there a bit. Certainly my ideas about evolution still continue to resonate. I mean, some of our like understandings about natural history were things like not everything has to serve a purpose. Sometimes, for example, animals play or sometimes, I mean, organisms aren't really machines in the sense that not everybody part has one function only. But if you look in nature, it's actually extremely rare to see one body part or one adaptation or one behavior, one behavior with a single function only. So basically... We kind of wanted to do that, but of course, this is the realm of science. So, like, I had to go back a lot and, like, put a lot of, like, girders in place mm -hmm. and, like, write in a slightly more pedantic way. And also think about the audience, too, that, like, so I wanted to write a, uh, this book for basically anyone interested in dinosaurs. But if they were, like, the OG, like, really into dinosaurs crowd they should also be able to like look into the references and like dig deeper about like source materials and stuff like that. And so that's the kind of writing I wanted to do. And, and that was done basically. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, I think key uh, elements of writing a good dinosaur book, even if you're writing for kids is not to belittle your readers Oh, yeah. These days, there are a lot of books out there, dinosaur books out there, for like, I hate to use this word, but for, for like normie parents who think their kids are into dinosaurs only because they're like, rah, screaming. Yeah. Whereas like, I, th I think you felt this too. As a kid, you could tell when people are bullshitting. Come on, come <laughs> on. Yeah. It's like, I mean, if you want a book like that, go read Where the Wild Things Are. When a yeah. kid wants to read about dinosaurs, he or she, even when they're like very young and like silly, they know like they know how to tell apart a good, well done, well illustrated, academically rigorous dinosaur book. Like you just know in your heart mm -hmm. like, when something is good. So in the case of all yesterdays, even when the book was kind of a easy reading book, I just wanted to like pack the foundations with like good science and good references yeah and, and so did john conway i think i mean like he's like a genius of an artist like he's one of those artists that i really look up to his oh, illustrations yeah. are extremely lifelike are very well done mm. and and so it was a nice nice group effort one of the nicer parts in that book of course is the all today's section in which we commit willingly the errors we see in commonplace dinosaur art i thought that was so great yeah um, so like every creature is a monster you know things are drawn as like basic skeletons almost so yeah actually do you do you really want to quickly give um a quick overview of what paleo art is and what the i guess the objective of this practice is of course i mean paleo art is the practice of trying to draw and imagine creatures from the past. And basically, Jurassic Park is also could be considered a medium of paleo art. Mm -hmm. Basically, with paleo art, you realize, you look at the skeletons of these animals. Like Once you look at, into the kitchen of how dinosaur art is made, you look at the skeletons of these creatures, and then you look at the skeletons of creatures living today. And even if they're like the scaliest like monst most monstrous reptiles you seldom see every bone like if you look at the skeleton of an alligator okay the alligator has the teeth showing but aside from that its body is actually quite hefty and chunky there's lots mm -hmm. of like 
meat in the tail. Yeah. That's actually what you eat when you eat kahun alligator, which is, I think, great, great food, by the way. <laughs> Fried alligator tail. Oh. Anyways, so like lots of animals have these things. Considering now that dinosaurs are closely related to birds, you also get to think about things like plumage or scale mm. or even like things like wattles on the face, you know. If you look at lots of bird skulls, they're just bird skull. Yeah. But if you just look at their like, especially in the cases of like ducks or pheasants, they have like these crazy colors and like fleshy things on their head. So even if you skip aside the feathers, or if you're like, for some we weird reason, don't want to give them feathers, it's clear that these animals were like far more visually ornamented than what we give them credit for. And there's just, with some of these ornaments or details, there's just no way to know. With certain things like the failed tail fat or the heavy chunky tails, okay, you have to like, we know it was there, but it's just not drawn in there. Mm -hmm. In a lot of old dinosaur books, the artists draw only from the skeletons. So mm -hmm. the back part of the dinosaur looks like it has got some weird thing, like a coat piece sticking out. Ah, yeah. and, and that's just not the case with any creature. So yeah. you can like bet your ass, pun intended, <laughs> that they had some ass. So that's the known unknown. Then you got unknown unknowns with things like, I mean, there are all these like weird predatory dinosaurs with strange crests or horns. And it's clear to see that they create, they carried some sort of visual signal, but it's just forever lost to time. How do we know? So in those areas, imagination comes into play. And I think in those weird cases, you can actually be more realistic if you're more fantastic. Now, I'm not saying like give the creature okay. dragon wings or like, I don't know, a 10-foot balloon on its head. But if you look at the behavior of reptiles and birds or even mammals, like any, any animal that's alive today, okay? Things like the... Uh, the antlers of a deer and the way they shed the skin from them in in the, so who knows maybe i mean like not the same thing but similar weird things may have happened you just know almost certainly know. yeah like cause look, life is so complex i mean look at the cambrian explosion and like all these things like these are things that would come <laughs> from this so it's like it's going to have a plethora of complexity that we can't even we can only speculate and we can't yeah, be yeah, fantastical yeah. in that speculation and and these lost details are frustratingly the main deal of these animals. Like, how do you know a tiger by its spelt? If it if if you just knew tigers from fossils, you would never get the sense of that pattern. How do you know a parrot because of its vocal mimicry? Well, if you only knew the skulls of parrots, you would think maybe they're like some nut cracking, boring creature, but you would never know disabilities. To so like the salient characteristics of animals don't fossilize and for that i think we could go out on a limb but in in the in the book we kind of play it safe and call this like willing speculation or like thoughtful speculation or something so yeah i don't know it, it really resonated well with people and lots of people liked all yesterday's so so that was good i think yeah and is it um because it seems to be it is quite prevalent in like paleo art communities and things like that um what are the primary is it primarily bought by individual consumers or are universities buying it or what are the i think all yesterday's aside from all tomorrows has been like the most accessible book to mm. individuals so a lot of people have bought it and are buying it i think like we're pretty spread thin, but everyone who's dabbled in paleo art has gotten this book uh, in ebook format mm -hmm. or maybe pirated it. I don't know, but I think lots of people get this and I mean, still pay some of my bills even <laughs> 10 days after it was 10 years after it was released. So, so hey. that's good. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. For anyone at home, if you want a good poignant example of the extent the extents to which we could take paleo art, it is a good idea to see 
um, your rendition of a of a swan, how we might interpret a swan based on Ooh. just the fossil records. That one stuck with me because I was like, I mean, so many birds would look like they had these raptory pointy arms and stuff like that because we couldn't imagine the plumage and just yeah, stuff like yeah. that. It's a very good example. I mean, I I I one of my like favorite. Sometimes people ask like, how do you improve in paleo art? And I say, like, go to these websites and look at these x-rays of animals. And you just see how how little the bones alone preserve. They also preserve a lot. But, like, you first got to realize that how much goes unrepresented. Then go back to dinosaur skeletons with the same attitude and try to flesh them out that way. Mm -hmm. Because really, also there's something about dinosaur skeletons that... Like in the museums, the skeletons are the center piece, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you look at those things and you say, that's like, I mean, if the skeleton itself was moving, you would believe it was a monster like that. So mm. you kind of have to like realize what goes over a skeleton. And then mm -hmm. if you start drawing that way, I think you're on right track. And for the record, let me say that this book has inspired by this book has inspired artists whose skill far surpasses mine, and I'm just so happy and proud. Oh, that's um. So you mentioned in, I believe you talk about it in your book. I also you talk about it in a TED talk you did a few years mm -hmm. back. I watched I watched that. Um, you in mentioned Spain, that a lot of actually where you are. Oh, now. that's right. It was in Madrid. Yeah. Yeah. The um, but you mentioned previous a lot of like um the iconic images that we kind of accept as this must be what it looks like now because it's just become they're popularized images mm -hmm, so they're mm -hmm. taken as the normal set slash taken as fact um you said a lot of those images came from people that um did a lot of sort of biblical representations or they're very they're very mm -hmm. um or like representations of the flood and things like that um yes the early earliest paleo art was like yeah that. very early and then that sort of informed future paleo art because we're basing it off of these very early images. And then yeah. it feels like relatively recently that we're starting to, it was actually around, I know, like even between Jurassic Park 1 and Jurassic Park 3, you start to see differences in how we're representing mm -hmm. dinosaurs because they start to find that, they start to find rep like uh, evidence of like feathers on things. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like so relatively recently, we really started to get very creative with how we represent these dinosaurs and um extinct mammals as well yeah what do you do you have any i guess wish for where paleo art goes or do you have any idea of what you would like to see happen or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's a very nice question by the way oh, so the well the earliest kind of visions of dinosaurs really were in informed by this like uh, pre-adamic flood representations and there's this whole like um, semantic trope about dinosaurs being representations of a uh, obsolete world of violence. Mm. So, but there's also something about dinosaurs themselves, like especially if you look at uh, the kind of post 1950s, mostly uh, American representations of dinosaurs. They're almost like action figures without copyrights yeah so, like you got the horned one with the headbutt action you got the biting one with the bite action you got the long one with the long neck you got the spiky tail one with the spiky tail action yeah so the animals themselves also like land themselves because they're like so outlandish but to land to to summarize the long story i i would like to see personally two things one would be a more Mannerist depiction of mannerist depiction of extinct animals. That is to say, maybe in some cases we need to also this is informed by my other side hustle as a surreal painter. In some cases, we need to abandon the even the thing about visual accuracy altogether and try to try just look at the fossils directly and paint something like cave art you would see because like if you look at those depictions of bisons and mammoths in cave art i think they're like not only they are our species oldest artistic heritage 
They're also like surprisingly well done. They really like identified animals, but they're not anatomically pedantic. Yeah. I mean, their features are kind of exaggerated and kind of like, I mean, the closest word I can find to this is manneristic, you know? And in saying this, I make a very important caveat. So it's not like drawing dinosaurs in the style of Van Gogh, you know, because that's also like AI art stuff, like, you know, T-Rex rendered in Art Nouveau style or something. Mm. But you just like look at this fossil directly and exp try to express its like salient tingness with maybe just raw colors and shades. That's something I like to try and mm. experiment on. And it's very hard to do this without coming across as a kind of like uh, triceratops in the style of Van Gogh kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Once again, I think my friend John Conway is like breaking new ground in that thing. So he has like some ah. really nice, yeah, he has some really nice impressionistic takes on dinosaurs without being like pastiche about it. So like he has pieces about like a duck built dinosaur but it's just like a very faint collection of spots. And if you squint, you think yeah. maybe you can see the animals. Ah, so I love that. That's the whole, like, that's the closest you can get by looking at fossils. So that's the whole trick there too. Another side alley is, I think, uh, computer-driven digital arts, especially animation and related fields. Mm -hmm. And there, there are these, like, some new talented artists who are just going to, like, bury people like me and John Conway alive. They're just so amazingly skilled. I mean, they, they do these 3D models of these creatures that really look like photographs, but they also look like real lived-in animals, you know, like their feathers are ruffled, they're, like, they're dusty, they're uh, kind of, like, silly-looking sometimes. So good. And I'm really curious to see what comes out of that whole, like, digital... 3D representation of creatures too, because it's something technically I'm completely unable to do. And like even 10 years ago, it would have needed something like uh, the budget of industrial light and magic, you know, like the budget of a big studio to realize. Yeah. But now somebody can do it from their laptop. And I just find that very exciting. It is. As well as like... um. Well, yeah, like you said, the budgets, like in general, people are just having more and more access to more impressive tools, just as we're refining our exactly. art of making technology. So as a result, the the sample size is larger of mines that we're plucking, mm -mm -mm -mm. which is great. I'm actually going to drop a name for your listeners. Just need to search yeah. for one, one second. This Polish... Uh, Polish artist Joanna, that's J O A N N A, Kobierska, K O B I E R S K A. I mean, if you look at her creations, it's a whole other ball game, whole other ball game. I like stand in awe in front of her works. Uh, really, really nice stuff. And for anyone listening at home, if you're thinking like, you know, this this speculative take on representing dinosaurs, if it feels sacrilegious, the other extreme is that you fall into very hard rutted almost dogma if you just accept. Because in the end, we don't really know. Like, there are so much things that we can't say for sure aside from things we can kind of immediately layer over a skeleton. So it is just the act of constantly refreshing and asking what if and exploring the possibilities and you know, not letting anything become too cemented. Yeah. I'm actually sending you some images from this, uh, from Joanna Kobierska's work on the chat. Mm. So, oh, uh, yeah. You can get a sense of, and I always like uh, promoting fellow artists in these like media appearances, fellow artists, fellow authors. Absolutely. I think it's just a cool thing. I think one of the images just uh, came through. Yeah. That is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it really looks like they really look like things you might see in a swamp or even scampering in the street somehow. Yeah, and and are these representations of they look raptor in nature? This is like the the second one I sent you is uh, something called a pyroraptor, which is basically a, a turkey sized 
version of that whole family. Mm -hmm. And the first one is Silophysis, you know, the early, lightly built Triassic era predator dinosaur. Ah, okay. So it's a kind of lighter version of, it's one of the first uh, well-known dinosaurs, but you can see how it's like skin sags and it's kind of like the 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 feathers are kind of like messy and greasy and it's like it's like something you might see like a, a possum or a stoat you know in front of your porch true yeah i see what you mean it's like um greasy down feathers almost yeah yeah so uh, Joanna Kobierska really has this way of capturing the animalness of these animals. Yeah, there's a lot of life in these. I just need to get this mm, cooler for my laptop. Just a second. Okay, yeah. Behold my amazing cooler. Oh my gosh. <laughs> ice box with, in a pan. I just put this below That's... my laptop. It's clever. Yeah, this old fella has been with me for 10 years. It's a 10-year-old laptop. Far out. Yeah. That's impressive. Is it yeah, a... Just, this is not an advertisement either. Is it an, a Mac? I find that they're... It's they a Mac, for yes. for a long time. Yeah. yeah they, they do, like... And I, I've been, like, also careful about... I'm not using it for gaming, and I think gaming wears out uh, processors and shit quite fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But old fellas getting to his last years, and I'm just oh, treating him well. <laughs> yeah. With his bedpan. Yeah, and yeah. Um, well, really, I really just kind of want to touch on to, um, so you, you have, you know, all tomorrows, which is speculating future evolutionary branches of mm -hmm. the human branch, all yesterday's, which is looking at fossil records. Mm -hmm. And then you have something and within, like you mentioned all today's, the concept being, uh, mm -hmm. extraterrestrial paleontologists coming down and building animal, like speculating animal species based off of, um, fossil records of our present day animals mm -hmm. and then now it sounds like you're going even further with the was it Snyad project am i saying Ooh, that right oh yes yes so, so so yeah thank you i mean Snyad is a big big long running work and mm. basically it's my version of like what if like we really got to see and all my learnings from my studies of evolutionary history the way i studied practical biomechanics by looking at dinosaur skeletons and animal skeletons mm. and basically some flights of fancy I want to make because of course this is art so I combined them all this was actually once again Snyat has an older version you can see for free in my website cmkozeman.com and it was launched in 2008 basically it's like a field guide to many creatures from an alien world. And I've been rebooting and relaunching Snyad for the past five years now, drawing creatures. Once again, I'm just rehauling everything and rewriting everything. And like the weird thing with Snyad is that I get to like play a little. And sometimes like, for example, in this world, there's a lineage of like insect size creatures, but they're actually the descendants of big bodied vertebrates. So oh, yeah. imagine like cockroaches, but they're actually like very tiny mice with no bones. So, or even flies and ants that way. So that's one nice thing about it. They're also like, like little things. For example, there are bird like flying creatures, but instead of singing songs, they have these glands which kind of make this bright white paint. Oh my and gosh. And they just dot all over the branches or rocks or wherever they live with patterns like that Japanese artist Yaoi Kusama. And every species has a different, like there's a dasher, there's a dotter, there's a waver. Like, so it's like you oh. look at the branch, like, oh, it's the cerulean dasher. <laughs> Why are you coming at this time of the year? Or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. So so there it's just like like all tomorrows. I think it's going to take longer to finish than all tomorrows. Mm. But just just uh like with all tomorrows I want it to be the great big work of this decade of my life basically. With all tomorrows you want that to be? 
Yeah, yeah, with all tomorrows yeah. and Snyat. So these oh, two yeah. things, I want them to be the two great big deals of my life. I, well, I'm behind you on it. I want to see, I want to see it come out. Um, yeah, yeah. But one of the things that I really love about this Snyad project is that it uh, once again just like pushes the bounds of it challenges normalcy and like we mm -hmm. consider normalcy to be like this is how it is because this is how it is like we're born mm -hmm. looking at these shapes these forms and it's like mm -hmm. oh there can't be a creature like you know one of the creatures you have there can't be a creature like that because creatures are like this and it's like well mm -hmm. they're like this because it happened to be this way but you know oh yes yes and I love how much it challenges that about like, um, you know, most of your creatures have this distant relative that have this appendage or looks like an appendage coming off of their chests. And yeah, in reality, it's, it's you know, more second of... mouth. It's the like actual mouth opening straight from the chest. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, at first it feels so bizarre to see that on all of the creatures. But when you look at this lineage of all these creatures, it, makes sense it's like oh, okay well this is their normal yeah and yeah. i love that yeah that was like a little thing i did at first and then it kind of stuck and i said okay let's make this one of the brass tacks of the project mm -hmm. and so a lot of the animals on snyat have this like basically the mouth comes out straight from their chest and the head is actually quite small there's only the eyes and some other sensors and there's a beak sometimes but the beak actually conceals genitals so like when they actually mate it looks very innocuous it looks like two <laughs> things kissing yeah and this is actually not so far off from real life mm. if you look at slugs their genitals are hidden away in their necks and that thing comes out it's as long as the slug's body and they have this like really weird looking mating dance so I just took something like that and applied it to something that's as large-bodied as a vertebrate animal, and I kind of ran with it. And But then, as you play this game and you stick to the rules, there are like caveats and secondary rules. For example, some predatory animals, these like little beaks that cover their genitals in their mouths, actually use that like the claws of a crab to kill their prey and then later absorb the like they cut it up with the big beak in the first head but then you use the second head to kind of like munch it up or like they they use the two heads to kind of chat chat tear it apart like mm. basically the claws of a crab and it's like at least biomechanically feasible and it's just a world where the direct mouth to head integration never properly evolved, so they mm. ran with it. And since this is a creative project, it's kind of like one of the brass tacks I stick to. Mm. But there are a lot of uh, decisions like that. Another nice thing is another thing I wanted to comment on with Snyad is that a lot of our like animal shapes and body forms are actually predicated by the plants and the natural ecosystem in these animals lives in these animals sure. live in so if you maybe change the structure of the plants dominating a landscape then you get a vastly different cast of characters so on snyad there are actually these like new floral ecosystems called sprog or citadel trees for example, citadel trees are like these, like, imagine like very thick growths of trees growing on top of each other, kind of like half shorn skyscrapers, but they're like spaced like one every two miles on a big plane. So this is like a plane with lots of like these giant tree stumps dotting it. And around the tree stumps, there's like a bush and maquis and stuff like that. So during the day, it's like animals browsing the plane. At mm. night, all these monsters come out of the citadels to hunt them. Mm. So it's like a whole different, like, whole different uh, ecosystem and way of living. The same thing with Sprog. Sprog is basically unique to Snyad. Imagine the ground being covered with masses of wet sponges. They retain water. So yeah. They're like hard to kind of walk on. 
So on these surfaces, you get more like snake-like creatures or like things with like padded feet so they can walk easier. Yeah. So I also made, wanted to make the commentary about the plants and the landscape affecting the development of large-bodied animals. And that's going well. I love that exercise of like, you know, you change something in the environment, you change something, and then from there you design, well, how would that adapt? How would that affect? Yeah, and yeah, you get yeah. some interesting fiction out of doing that sort of stuff. Um, one speculative thought I like to have is like, if humans evolved from more of a reptilian place or more of a cold-blooded place, and mm -hmm. you know, reptiles don't need to eat as often as we do because mm -hmm. they don't need to warm their bodies. And mm -hmm. because of that, um, you know, chances are restaurants wouldn't be a thing because eating wouldn't be as much of a social act potentially yeah. because it's you know exactly. something we're doing once a month once every few weeks whatever and it's more of a maintenance thing and maybe in place we get body warming locations where you go and just <laughs> huddle huddle and you know you lay under some very fine infrared very well crafted light mm -hmm. and you just warm up in very particular ways or something and you talk yeah. with your family while you do it instead and... of cushions you have uh instead of food critics you have cushion critics <laughs> Another thing with another thing with being a reptile is that they're not social in the way mammals are because they hatch True. out of eggs. Yeah. So you could also have I actually had a similar fantasy but ended up in a different place. Mm -hmm. And basically it was during an arts lecture somebody else was giving and the speaker said we only make art for other people to see. I said what if people made art for no one to see? And then I imagined this like other reptile human inhabitation where like you hatch out of an egg yeah. you don't know your parents exactly but somehow society is there to like take care of basic things you collaborate out of necessity but mostly everyone's to themselves mm. in your house you paint but only because you like to look at it and I, I always thought about like what that art would look like and how it would be from uh, regular, more social source of art. But yeah, that's the great thing about speculative evolution. Like, it's just so much more beyond just like drawing strange creatures, but it's actually like a really useful sandbox for science, philosophy, even social issues, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes anyone involved in it all the more wealthier uh, intellectually for having indulged in it. And that's like, um, you know, because speculative fiction is a pretty massive mm -hmm. genre. It's not even really a genre. It's more of just, I don't know, it consumes so many other genres under its umbrella. But it's like, it is just a lot of books are like, change one aspect of society, what happens. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. that's a lot of my writing. And then like, or, um, you know, you have books that speculate on political shifts and books that speculate on economic Ooh. shifts and historical fiction where you that, just like change something in history and that's it's the art of and thought of speculative fiction and it's the practice of breaking your normal like the there's things, a whole yeah. subgenre alternative history which which is i think like a close 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 sibling of speculative evolution i really mm -hmm. like that genre too i did a whole alt fiction alt alt italian bubonic plague Ooh. thing yeah that was fun um so re the renaissance never takes off or like what's the what's the what's the it, as they call it these days what's the canon event what's the, the... canon event <laughs> yeah um i guess really all that happens is um the virus isn't there's a, it's a bit more sinister and a bit more intentional, I guess. Mm. So it's more of a plague thing like that. And it's, uh, no, I, don't, I guess I don't speculate far into the future because I actually designed it to be um, a platform for a role playing event. So you're actually not, you don't go further into the future. You really kind of stay in that event of the virus mm -hmm. is breaking out, something's happening. And then it's more of a speculative speculation on what is happening because there are some unique qualities to this virus that are, People aren't just dying. Some other things are going on that are pretty You must have some cool uh, Plague Doctor outfits, that's for sure. <laughs> well, that was the thing that... So I went um, 
pretty medieval with it. I went to the first outbreak and it wasn't until I was pretty deep in that mm-hmm. I realized um, like plague doctor outfits and even um, Nostradamus and them, like they didn't come along until the second outbreak, which was much further yeah, yeah. in history. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm bringing them in anyway, because <laughs> because Nostradamus will be here anyway, because he's too integral to the plot I've got going on. And I'm writing this world anyway. So I say he's there. Ah, oh, nice, nice. They used to blame all sorts of stuff from the plague, like Oh my gosh. Swallows were considered to be vectors at some point. I, it was very weird. I once remember... again, fear of the Jews, once again. Oh, oh, they course. got a, a brunt of that. That was terrible. Are you also of Jewish background yourself? I am. Um yeah, um actually on my mom's side. I'm not a practicing I don't practice my mom, but my mom just recently started getting very involved with that side of her um she's learning hebrew practicing again um mazel tov uh, it's for me it's even stranger because i mean in my family we knew for a long time that there was something like this mm. but nobody quite knew how or when and we we're all registered as like uh, turkish muslims mm. but it's just so either they were members of this uh, Sabbatean group, which kind of like, it's a whole other weird tangent we could get into. Basically, they follow the false messiah in the year 1666. I'm not making this up. Mm-hmm. And when the messiah got too serious, the Ottoman authorities forced him to convert or else. Mm-hmm. Some families believed so deeply in this messiah that they converted to Islam alongside him. Mm. but kept marrying among themselves with a sort of crypto-Jewish identity. So we either thought either we have that sort of background or throughout Ottoman history, the Ottoman Empire was a very multicultural uh, empire. There were many Jews who converted to Islam just because they could get government jobs, for example. Uh, yeah. And so either we had that or something like that. And that, but when I did a DNA test, it, comes out something like 30% Sephardic and the rest comes out Italian or West Mediterranean. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So I, you might probably know also, I also write, wrote some books about local Jewish history in the... I saw I saw something like, I can't remember the title, but I remember seeing I remember seeing that under your, your works. Yeah, yeah. So that's a whole other side of me that, you know, I'm nice to, it's nice to have. I don't feel religious at all, but I think there's a certain sensibility that comes with this background, and I really value it, and I think it adds a lot to my life. I I very much so admire the sense of community that Jewish the Jewish community they go out of their way to build it, mm-hmm. and it's really like um it's important to them, and like you mm-hmm. see it like they they live in similar communities, they stay together, and they really like. You know, you could look at it and kind of be like, oh, that's insular of them, whatever. But it's like, no, they're not shutting anyone out, but they're just choosing to prioritize mm-hmm. community. And it's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly. Yeah, I really like that about um, Jewish culture. I also think there are like some unchanged brass texts, like even if you're like the most atheist, the atheist Jew ever, <laughs> that there's just a certain way of looking at life and like... Mm. I mean, because of this sort of um, unintegrated background, like usually Jewish people are one of the first groups in any community who can say, come on, that's bullshit. And I think that's really valuable. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. Well, nice, nice. What are the chances? eh? Long cousins talking about dinosaurs and reptile (laughs) people. (laughs) Um. Well, I think we'll we'll go ahead and start closing it down there. Um, All right. Do you, do you have any closing remarks that you'd you'd like to? Yes, I have two with? remarks actually. Um, one, if if you're interested in my stuff, I also recommend my YouTube channel, which is oh, yeah. youtubecom cozman. I also recommend like if you like this conversation, if you support me on patreoncom cozman. Uh, as little as a dollar a month, like you get to see all sorts of surreal paintings no one else sees, excerpts from All Tomorrows and my other projects, 
and it's really, really, really welcome. Also, I have the second thing going on, which is this sort of American outreach project I'm doing. It could be also European or the UK outreach. I don't mind. But mm. I just like, I'm looking at uh, analytics on YouTube and my website, and it's like 78% of everyone comes from the States. And wow. judging from the fan mail I get, like almost in every small town in the US, there seems to be this weird old tomorrow's kids who are like into my stuff. <laughs> so I really like like that. You know, I'm really yeah. happy about that. And long story short is I'm looking for opportunities to come to the United States as a speaker for an, any event you might have. You don't need to give me money, only cover my tickets and accommodation costs, and I'd be happy to be your guest. You could sell tickets, charge money. I don't care. You know, just get me in a bed and breakfast. I like <laughs> have like, like bacon and like stuff of American food. I'm really huge, huge fan. Like feed me, house me, ship me, and I'll be your speaker. Also, I'm looking to hold exhibits of my surreal art. We didn't talk much about that here, but that's okay. Mm. So if you like go deeper into the cosm and worse, and if you like my surreal art, and if you happen to be managing an art space in the States or something, that I would be like forever be in your debt. So, so in those notes, I say thank you. And thanks for featuring me in your podcast. Yeah, yeah. no, thanks. Thanks for coming on. Like it, it's honestly very great. And yeah, if, uh, you know, he mentions a Patreon, a YouTube channel, all these things, have a look at his stuff, his stories. He creates incredibly rich worlds that are just so grippingly rooted in reality at least that's what i think and um his art style is mm. i'm not even whatever take a look you. you're gonna love it as well and then from there you decide what you want to do but chances are you're going to want to do something i know i listened to his story and immediately wanted to reach out to him to talk to him so there you go thanks, lots of thanks yeah and also like if fellow listeners have their own podcasts i'll turn up for the opening of an envelope so like <laughs> yeah yeah I'll, I'll speak for any occasion there you go so on on these um usually when we end these podcasts we usually end with a, a quote from someone and i just wanted to quickly drop a quote that actually you said i'm not sure mm. if it i'm pretty sure it was you um you said it at the end of your ted talk and i just thought it was very mm. on point but you said uh, you're talking about how an important part of science isn't to say I have the answer, I have the conclusion or anything like that. You said it's to say, here's li here lies a mystery. Yeah. What do you think it looks like? And yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that's a like that's a quote I can stand behind. Like science is not the pursuit of uh, it is the pursuit of answers to some degree, but it's actually like the nailing down of problems. Mm hmm. So identify questions and each each answer opens up new questions and that's like the nice infinite generative thing about life in general mm -hmm. and it informs both science and art which are really just two branches of very they're both very creative aspects mm -hmm. yes i mean art and science are like this forcibly divorced couples yeah but i think science without art is inhuman Mm. And I think art without science is just frivolous. I feel that. So so there, that could be another quote for the day. There we go. Well, thank you very much uh, oh, for man, your time. The pleasure and... is mine. Have a nice yeah. day. You as well. And there you have it. Thanks again for listening. And just one final note for the end here. Uh, we do have our anthology, The New Mythic, out on Amazon. Uh, nominated for not one but two awards and it's just a great book go get yourself a copy if you haven't yet uh, ebooks are very cheap the paperbacks are less cheap but they're also gorgeous uh, so definitely worth it um, as well as if you've liked if you've liked what you've heard so far um, don't be shy about giving us a review uh, it would mean a lot to us and it helps other people find it and makes us feel all sorts of warm, fuzzy feelings. Uh, leave us a comment as well. We've gotten a few comments here and there, and they always um, it's always great to engage directly with the people that are listening to this because we like talking about it. It's nice to hear other people like talking about it, all that stuff. So yeah, leave a review if you haven't yet. 
uh, it would mean a lot. And thanks once again for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction Podcast.